Hey there, Russ. How's it going? Just setting some stuff up. <clears throat> Dropping a couple people a note who said to remind them about the stream. And then we'll, we'll start chatting at some point. process of being cat bombed. How's it going with you today? that at least we got a break from the heat sort of yeah yeah really it's not a the backyard it's the backyard it's yellow <laughs> it's it's so it's so dried up it's pretty pretty scary i guess i'll start with my usual usual pitch so anyone who happens to be tuning in hey there's peach must be wednesday starting with the usual pitch for anyone who's just tuning in or is going to watch this afterwards, obviously, if you're watching it on Twitch Live, you know where I'm at. If you'd like to, please follow the channel. We are growing in membership, and it's really great, and I'm very grateful for it. But it would be cool to, to even have a, have a higher membership. That would be really cool. So if you could do that, if you have not already, though I think almost everyone who's on at the moment has, Obviously, if you are watching it from YouTube, you can drop over and not only join the live chats, but see some of the additional archived footage over on the Twitch stream. And if you uh, have not, you can go subscribe over at Fox and Board Games on YouTube. Uh, there is, I can pull up the channel for that right now. It's actually a playlist for all these live chat videos. And let me just pull that up here. I'll just drop it right in the chat in case anyone pops on who has not subscribed to it yet. On extensive play. How's it going with you, Peach? Tendons. Yeah. So, um, there's also a Twitter and Facebook page at Fox and Board Games. That's in one place. Okay, it's tomorrow. Um, yeah. Remote's nice. I like remote, obviously. So you can go ahead and you can stop over there. Uh, also, Tales of the Harrowed Land RPG, harrowedlandrpg.com, which will eventually be supplanted by foxandboardgames.com, though the developer's blog that I have over on the website will probably remain intact in some form. Uh, and again, I am extremely thrilled with the amount of traffic that this channel has picked up in the last couple weeks. It's pretty uh, pretty flattering. In addition to the Wednesday night chats, I've been doing weekday streams of my work process in developing the Tales of the Harrowed Land RPG. And uh, in addition to just some other material, I did some map making one day and a few other, a few other, I did some graphics work one day. 
uh, those kind of, that are all related to the game. So as the game progresses and as we get closer to publication, uh, that will probably all ramp up. And in fact, I've got a couple cool thematic talks planned for the rest of this year. I talked to a, I've talked to a couple people who do things in the world of games and cons and related activities who would like to probably come on and do a guest guest chat and that would be kind of cool so we'll see where this goes we'll see as it continues to ramp up so i'll pop myself back on and i think we're going to cut right to the chase i'm tending tending to find these things are definitely uh somewhat more popular this one could get spicy. I don't know how many people were going to have. A lot of people said they were interested, but as of tonight, only a few people were committed, which I get. It's pretty, you know, these pretty nice nights, these midsummer nights. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have a few people come on and contribute. So let's just go right to it. Yeah, I, I did that quite intentionally. That's been an ongoing joke of mine for a while, right? Let me get my let me get my lovely let me get my lovely art up here. My masterful level graphic design. I went to school for this, you know. Nobody cares about your character backstory. It's an interesting discussion, and I have a lot. I've had a lot of interesting discussion, both on private chats with people about this, and in um, in you know in forums that I've posted this event to. And the Call of Cthulhu forum on Facebook, I posted it there. And I and there's probably about 50 replies discussing it, which is pretty exciting. And of course, I'm like, well, guys, come on over to the chat. But I know not everybody wants to you know, log into Twitch and all that. And that's fine. But I post it there also just because it generates conversation. It generates ideas. I mean, nobody cares about your backstory. Who cares, right? I don't care your character's family was killed by rampant potato farming kobolds. 30 years before you became an adventurer? Come on. Who cares about that? Seriously, though. Um, it's, it's an interesting discussion. I mean, I've gone, I've gone completely minimal in my character prep. I, I am the guy that used to write, you know, six, six pages of history on my, my character's life and where he came from, or they came from, or she came from, and and put in all these details and all these hooks for the storyteller, game master, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, so I see you just wrote the same exact thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm on the fence. So, just to preface this, as a guy currently running games for the most part, I sometimes have a table of six to seven players. And I know a lot of people have been blown away when I say that, but it's true. And for this, when we started the D&D game, I had two players, uh, both of which have popped, both of whom have popped in here from time to time, who have given, like, given me really extensive backstories. Now, obviously, as a creative person, I really appreciate that. And I really like it. But the challenge is, of course... What do I do with that when we play on the average of three to four hours? And sometimes that's not even the most solid game time that there could be. <clears throat> and I have six people around the table. 
I mean, it's really difficult. And, and I've said that. I've been blunt with everybody about that. Like, I, I love reading your stories about your characters. I love that people put so much thought into it. You know, and don't put it, don't put enough. If you don't read any backstory at all, then is really into the character, right? Well, you know, Ross, that's interesting because I recently just started playing a vampire character uh, a couple, you know, a month ago or so. And Vampires, that game, along with Call of Cthulhu and any historically based game that I just go down these research rabbit holes. I mean, I get lost for nights reading about the time period the character could have been from, things that were going on. And of course, my compulsion is, oh, that's so awesome. I got to put all that in. This most recent character, I think I wrote eight sentences, ten sentences. Was a stage vaudeville performer at this time. Traveled here, here, and here. Knows these people. Um, and Cobalt Potato Farms who got them riled up. Yeah. Yeah. Were your family bastards, right? Did the potato, did the, did the Cobalt Potato Farmers really, like, did they have the coming? Were those potato farmers really riled up? Hey, there's Nikki. How's it going? We're just kind of getting started. Do you write a lot about your characters, Nikki? And you draw a lot about your characters. I've seen that firsthand, which is which is an interesting thing because it's a different way to approach it. Yeah. Um. So when I have six or seven people at a table, particularly a plot based game, a task based game, right? Like D and D, you're hired to go investigate this problem. Ninety nine percent of the games. It's very interesting when there's an opportunity to include character details and personal details, but you know how much. Well, so how much is that? How much that can be included when it comes to something like vampire? You know, vampires, especially that uh, a lot of the people I, that come on this feed or that I've I've met through the game. I actually meet from a I've met through a LARP environment. I figure I'll I figure I'll just sneak that right down there. Because none of you really care about seeing me. You all care about seeing the cat, though. That's an almost definite. It's an almost definite thing. Um, you know, vampire. The characters are. It's character centric. The game is not. The plots are not written for the game master to unveil his latest greatest plot. Because let's face it, most vampire games are basically the same anyway. It's the different characters that make them interesting. I'm just gonna I'm enjoying reading your comments. That's half of why I do this. I could do these as one-off videos in front of I could set up all my lights and get my fancy camera out, like I've done for a couple of videos, and have a uh, have a serious diatribe going on here, but it's I'm just enjoying reading your video your comments. So why do players write backstories? Let's start there. Like and again, all this is are these all these are rhetorical prompts. Like, why do characters write backstories to get to know their character, to show how smart they are, to give? Uh, and I think Kaipo, uh, Kaipo said on a one of the forum threads to to give the game master things to torture you with. I don't know. I mean, I you know, and it's always a joke, right? Like. Nobody who had a family, uh, nobody who had a family life that was normal and a peaceful home life ever went out and decided to hunt a dragon, right? Like that's the whole joke. Even in D and D, these these kind of dark, these kind of dark backstories are more common because you know what sane person is going to leave the circumstances of of even relative day to day doldrum comfort and say, hey, you know, let's go kill a dragon. This is going to turn out really well. well. What are some of the other reasons? Is it just self indulgence? They just want to show you how smart they are, those players. And like I said, I'm not knocking anybody because I the two extensive backstories I got from the play group for D and D were really, really well done. They they were novels in and of themselves. And and Andy Hope and Flames, who is sometimes on here, who may or may not pop on, um, he's actually brought a lot of that into the play, so much so that he's taken his character out of play for periods of time to deal with his backstory issues and disappeared on the party, which was kind of interesting to me. I was like, you're voluntarily taking yourself out of this. And and you're kind of you're kind of making your own story as this is going on. Now again, I'm a game master with this group. I'm very liberal with that kind of stuff. You know, I, I'm not 
I don't feel the need to be heavy handed and say there's no way you can do that. I don't know, so I'll throw some, throw some, helps you know your character better. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's the general response. Hey, there's Lauren. How are you? We're just talking about the, the backstories, the great backstories. Oh, hey. So, Merzane, nice to meet you. We're, I was just talking about the great backstories you and Andy wrote for the D&D game. And how hard it is to actually incorporate it into, into, the, into the game with that many people. And I was also telling them that for your vampire game, I just wrote a very minimal few paragraphs. Which is totally unlike me. So, so I think the pros, a spontaneous usually gems. I like a backstory. It helps. So, I think... What it does, you know, there's, I forget which famous game designer or book this appeared in that the character sheet is basically a wish list to the game master, right? The character sheet is the wish list saying, this is what I want you to give me during the gaming experience. And I think the backstory is an extension of that. Now, I saw a lot of comments on threads when I was talking about this of, Oh, well, people come on and they want these special things from their backstory. I think the only time I've ever seen that, and PJ, you can attest, are some of the vampire LARPs. Where people came in with these insanely, usually ridiculously powerful characters. And they were like, but in my history it says, you know, I'm the prince of this city. And I have all these people under my control. And, and like, if the game wasn't built to accommodate that. Especially if you're in a LARP where you have a hundred other players to deal with, that's a very difficult thing to accommodate. Yeah, that player. And you know, in, in pen and paper, I, I maybe I've had half a dozen of people people in on pen and paper games who've done that. Yeah, well, well, so exactly, and. And your, so your, and that's what's funny is your backstory provided the impetus of the fortune teller who eventually became pivotal later in the Ravenloft scenario. And so that, I mean, so the backstory did affect, right? Like, you know, I, I'm here being sarcastic saying nobody cares about your backstory. And clearly anybody who's spent any time with me as a game master knows that isn't true. And the, the challenge, as I was saying earlier, Laura, is that in our group, we have so many people. Like, if we were playing with three people, doing everybody's individual stories would be really easy, but it's really tough. So from where I see it, the pros are you get a greater grasp on your character motivations and concepts, right? Something to draw on for plot hooks. Like, though, that's the biggest reason why I see players bring a backstory. I think the flip side of this... Yeah, it's hard to yeah, it's hard to visual and focus, especially because when you have a limited amount of time. And if I think if it were a strict, we always play this this game for this you know for four hours a week, five hours a week, every week. I think it's easier then to have these kind of, you know, these kind of other things that need to need to happen for the rest of the party to enjoy themselves. Um, and I've you know I've really rarely ever had a player be problematic about their, you know, being like, oh, well, I'm not getting my backstory fulfilled. Screw you guys. You know, I've never, I think maybe once or twice in all the years of gaming have I ever had anybody who's been difficult. I mean, I think the con of this, though, so, so this is what, this is what I think Peach was alluding to earlier, what I was just saying. I, I'm at the point that I prefer to have the character's most interesting moments occur when the game when the game starts. I like to throw hooks in. I like to throw a minimal amount of information. Like I've given Lauren a piece of my character's history as part of his vaudeville performance. That could completely... He's a Malkavian. So just, you can let your imagination run wild. That can completely start to derail my character's contemporary reality and i'll just leave it at that but i left it very vague and i even said i even said to lauren i said i said i don't know what the, the what the the answer to this mystery is that's for you to leave to for for i'm leaving you to decide it yeah well I, again i've given you all the tools for that i've given you the see he doesn't seem insane right now and that's the best part about the character so it's is at this point he seems kind of normal. 
Old Man Henderson, the famous 300-page backstory. So, so yeah. And, you know, I have a, my usual series of prompts prepared here. But, right, so at what point does this become unrealistic? That's the cons of this. That's what the next thing that I have. At what point is there an unexpected, unex, unrealistic expectation of work on the part of the player for the game master? You know, like, at what point is too much too much? At what point... If, if you're handed, okay, and full disclosure is I also teach. And most students are amazed to find out that I give them a word limit, maximum on papers, not on not a minimum. Um, because I, I, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and I, you know, I can't read someone's intro to photo essay about, you know, about at J, Eugene at J, that's 400 pages. Well, yeah, I, so, so, you know, Andy's backstory for Sky, I was like, he's written me a novel. Like, what am I going to do, you know? And it's great. And he's actually used it in the game. And he uses it in the game all the time. But, and again, the three, I mean, I'll never get through it, right? Uh, I've, I've barely gotten into Andy's actual novel that he's written that is, that is 300 pages. I've barely had the time to really start, and I have started reading it, so... Um, Gentleman thief, tiefling, raised by midwife grandmother because mom pined away for, for her angel. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, and as Marzane mentioned, sometimes the best are these vague pieces that are a good starting point. So, is a prequel game better off? Are you better off running a prequel session? A, a maybe a... a before even after se after session zero, the introduction, where people play out parts of their history. I know this is popular in the White Wolf games, especially in Vampire. Well, you you know, old man. The other story is on SoundCloud. Old Man Henderson, the character that won't call of Cthulhu. All right, I'll have to check this out. Yeah, well, people do that with Vampire, and Vampire is pretty famous. For having flashback and and embrace scenarios and pre-embrace scenarios, uh, and I think we did that when Diana ran it. We had a pre-embrace. So the last Call of Cthulhu game was actually, it was you know eight weeks of a prequel. Um, that that was actually an introduction to the entire world and the entire the entire setting and the entire plot. They were basically playing the prelude. Now again, that was a core part. It was meant to be a specific timeline and ending engagement. Not necessarily um, an ongoing campaign. So, does anybody require backstories for games they've run that require the players to write something about their character? Is anybody is anybody doing that, or has anybody experienced that? Some, read some responses. By the way, I chose Gollum not only because of the expressions, but because in his, in in, in some regards, his is like the ultimate backstory in terms of, in terms of fantasy literature. You know, like his backstory is really the whole story, and nothing happens without his backstory, without his involvement in his following through his story arc to the end, uh, and that's actually why I chose that. In addition, you know, in addition to obviously I thought it was just funny, this idea that players are, I, this was kind of inspired by a chat on a, on a D and D, on a D and D group that I'm on. Um, and, and several players were really mortified when somebody on the thread said, not, not even about this a couple months ago said, well, you know, nobody cares about the character backstories, you know? So I was like, man, that's interesting. campaign as a space to learn the characters more than move the plot yeah absolutely Merzane. so yeah and i think it depends on the type of game you run um 
Yeah, so Laura, that's that's this is funny because this goes all back to our discussions about our D and D game. You know, I I didn't have people do backstories, and some people, such as you know, you and Andy, volunteered them because I thought we were going to play three times. I mean, I, I never imagined this would be it. Now, going when we resume it, hopefully in the fall, it'll be like a three year long campaign. I never imagined anybody would get this into this game. So I I I couldn't even have imagined plotting a story around the the characters in D and I find to be one of the most difficult games to actually make personalized especially if you have a big party and especially if you have a very plot centric campaign well yeah oh absolutely it, and that was you know and there's also a lot of debate that tolkien originally of course, when he had Gollum in mind way back in The Hobbit, there was absolutely no idea that this was going to be the basically prelude to this epic, epic fantasy that would you know, define fantasy literature, basically. Um, and he didn't just sit down and start out with saying, you know, back in the day that that guy Gollum you met found this ring. You know, right. There was this unveiling. And I think. I think that's a great plot device in a game, too. I think it's more difficult to execute in a game, obviously, than in a static novel. But I think you can do it. I think you can do it. Yeah, okay. Thanks for stopping in. Definitely. Feel free lurking and cooking. I got a few people who do that. Usually Fuzzy and a few other people are who are here. They pop in and say hi. Uh, Justin sometimes is is busy doing other stuff, so... So I've never required a backstory, you know, like I, I've never, I've always, I've never sat down and said, you have to write me a character history. Not everybody's a writer. Not even everybody who loves RPGs, right? I mean, not everybody has the time, momentum, energy to sit down and write. Um, like I know, I know, I know Nikki draws a lot of her characters because I saw a lot of those and those, that's, that's pretty cool too. That's another way to approach it is illustrating your characters. I know Lauren illustrates a lot of stuff from our games. But it's a weird it's a weird thing to have that expectation in an unrealistic fashion, in spontaneous fashion. What I tend to do is I tend to have a question sheet that more or less comes from Creative Writing 101. You know, the who, what, when, where, why. But then I flesh it out a little bit and I ask another five to eight leading questions and I send it to the players. If it's a game where they're generating their own characters and they're going to be playing them for a duration. And I usually just start with a series of prompts and I say, okay, so, you know, I'll say things like, what's your character's favorite item that, he, that they possess and why? What is... What is the thing your character hates the most and why? Yeah, and when I anymore when I play, I, I find that the vast bulk of what I do is spontaneous in the character development. But I usually try to, at least for myself, do a little bit of back writing just so I have an idea where the character came from mentally. And, and what defines their current position and personality. I saw a really interesting note on the Pathfinder board regarding this saying, someone said, levels one through three are the backstory. Well, okay, that's kind of interesting. Like, you're basically off the farm, right? You assume most characters are off the farm. Um, you know, there's other ways to explain it. Like, when I was talking to Curzon, Tom, yesterday, when he stopped in, like, what? You know, I was talking about this topic... And I said, well, yeah, so so how does this explain the guy who writes into his backstory and says that he's like a famous prince or, you know, he's been with this famous mercenary band for decades and he's level one? Well, you could assume maybe he really wasn't that skilled and he got lucky. I don't know. I mean, is this the way that we can approach that? And in what regards, what regard do we 
incorporate these or how do we incorporate these things functionally into an RPG environment? You know, as a game master, how would you work someone's backstory into a game? I mean, obviously, we've already said you can have NPCs show up. If you're dealing with a horror game, and again, this goes back to almost all of our discussions on this this feed that a lot of this is very genre specific if not even game specific that let's see you don't do improv well yeah and that's that's sometimes the case too you know in a horror game sometimes knowing i remember when i read the one call of cthulhu game where i handed out characters i had extensive history written in because I felt it was important for the players who were truly role playing just stepping into these characters in a horror scenario to understand how their characters might react to trauma and might react to stress. And even in even in, in an RPG in a fantasy RPG setting, I think I would be a little bit broader. You know, I'd give a very much much more general history and then let them let them fill it in as they go. I'm just going to scroll back through the chat here to see if I missed anything. Yeah, but I think a lot of it has to do with character with character preferences and player, or sorry, player preferences. So that's an interesting thing, Marzane, you said earlier. Perhaps the best way... Perhaps these, perhaps the backstory discussion and the backstory inclusion works best when the plot points are in effect fluid, right? Like if you run into a situation in a game and a character's backstory can influence their decision making then do you pick up that story beat? And I think PJ said something about that earlier too. Do you pick up that story beat and let that inform your game? Let that inform your session? Yeah, and that's true too. Um, and this goes back to our whole discussion a couple of weeks ago. Is D&D its own genre at this point? You know, Is it its own, and basically its own fantasy world at this point? And what's the room for... What's the room for improvisation and kind of making things up on the fly? Well, <clears throat> and I think I think that's a play style thing too, as far as how central our character arcs to moving the story along and how much energy can the game master or does the game master choose to put into the story arcs I think that's an interesting point right the arcs are the story so I'm, I'm thinking of very character driven TV and novels right where the characters are extremely central. And I think this talks about the shift in gaming too, especially with some of the systems you've played and talked about, that there is definitely this shift from static plots, right? You, you find the dungeon, you go from room to room, you get stuff at the end, to more central, character-centric and individually motivated stories, maybe even in fantasy games. Right, and, and in, in something like d and I mean, the settings are definitely mutable, right? There's thousands and thousands of pages written about different D&D universes, but it, it, you're not bound to any of it. You know, you're not, you're not being forced That's a reality, right? Um, players will go towards what is shiny to them. You can have 
all of this amazing work put into your game about the here and now. But if something becomes interesting to a player, that's what they're going to focus on in the course of a game. Or if what you reward them, we've discussed this before, what you reward them for following and pursuing in some form. That's an interesting point. How do you get them to care, right? How do you get your players to care about it? Would, would paying attention to what they said their characters are interested in and incorporating that into the game help? So that's, that's interesting in terms of the backstory you didn't feel that you were dealing with as defined of a character or as believable or playable of a character without a backstory. Huh. And I guess I can see that. I mean, I just started a new D&D game, for the first game I've played in that's a focused, traditional, kind of old-school D&D setting and campaign this week. But it's a very reactive game. You know, there's clearly a set mission, goal, definition. It's not terribly individually character focused. And there's intentional reasons for that too, in terms of the group dynamic. But yeah, I mean, my character is very two dimensional. You know, everything that you would expect this dwarf cleric to do and like and not like, he doesn't like and doesn't like. And it's not a case where I felt that I had to make this extremely detailed character and create this elaborate backstory especially knowing that it was really going to be an exploration slash adventure versus an interpersonal or political or intrigue based setting i i've gotten like i said i've gotten to be a fan of straightforward characters and to let let the really interesting things happen throughout the course of play. I, I've i definitely, in the past, put way too much energy into, well, this is what my character does and likes and is motivated by, only to realize the GM had absolutely no way, coverage, or ability to address all this during the course of a game. Now... Anteater. Motivation. Ants. Yeah. We could also argue that in contemporary RPG environments, this is what Session Zero is for, right? Like, this is this is when we determine, are, are these players going to be interested in this type of plot that I have in mind before I sit and write, you know, 100 pages? Or are they going to be more interested in finding their lost ant in the woods? Not ant as an anteater, but their aunt. You know, if their character is extremely interested in their lost aunt in the woods, then does it make any sense to have them go to the castle with the evil wizard where their aunt is definitely not? Or unless you imply, maybe that's where she is. Right? That's It's kind of another way. Like, So let's look at uh, something I always like to talk about in terms of discussing character makeups. Um, if some of you, or all of you, I know some of you are, uh, I don't know how how old everybody. Well, I know how I think I know how old most of you are, but I don't remember saying it at all. If you're familiar with the X Files, right? The entire backstory of Mulder's sister being abducted by aliens. Aliens. You only had to mention aliens or his sister to get him involved in the story. It didn't matter if it was the lamprey man that hung out in porta potties, right? If there was even a hint. Of that there might be some relationship to these aliens. Oh, hey, how's it going? Maybe, uh, okay, nice to meet you. I think we have met in, in passing in hallways and in classrooms and stuff like that. Thanks for joining. Um, so if you two know about X-Files, oh, good. Yeah, you're not the youngest here anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell your friends, in addition to Rosane, to say hi, if they so choose. Again, if you're out there watching, I don't, I don't know you're present within the stream, which is absolutely fine. 
there's no pressure but if you're here and you're lurking feel free to say hi or not i know i had a couple people who said they were probably just going to tune in and listen for various reasons uh there some of them are busy with like their kids oh so you heard fox Mulder. so i mean so so if what's funny is i think i've used him as an example quite a few times when discussing character motivation and also when discussing concepts of obsession in a game and compulsion, like when people take like the flaw in Vampire of, you know, uh, uh, driving goal, right? And, and they think it's going to be like, oh, like my character really wants this sword. So maybe I'll go on the web and look for auctions of this sword. No, like if you take if you have a driving goal, I bring up, I bring up Mulder. And I bring up his obsession with aliens and finding his sister. You know, that it's this overriding thing. And here's a case where the backstory completely overshadows every decision that he makes. His personal backstory overshadows everything that he's done. Or if we go to Lord of the Rings, we can look at Boromir. Right? Boromir's entire history and his relationship to Gondor and to his father and into their perceived success and failings as the stewards of Gondor and guardians of Gondor shapes everything he does. Even to the point of endangering everybody and everything because he has been so formed by it. And, and I think this is an interesting discussion. Unfortunately, Curzon, Tom, couldn't make it tonight for a very good reason. A good reason, a celebration, a uh, birthday celebration with his partner. It was a case where um, we, I discussed with Tom yesterday. Okay, so you write this into your backstory, right? Do you as a player feel that in your character's motivations? Or is it just something on a piece of paper that's a note of interest? And I think that discussion starts to get into the territory of how emotionally invested do people get with their characters and what they have developed for their characters. I'm very, as I've already said, I do not get emotionally involved with my player or non-player gaming characters. I have no emotional connection to them. To me, they are an abstraction. They are literary characters that don't exist. Even if I put myself into their shoes... So I think I agree. I think the younger generation gets extre the younger generations get extremely attached. I think their characters are yeah. So your characters are your children. I know that because I've talked to you after seeing all your illustrations. I think that there is a greater permission to be very emotionally invested in your characters. I think there is culturally with people, definitely younger than my generation, to feel that their characters are significant and they want to invest energy. So, you know, it's funny. I absolutely, I mean, you absolutely do have to kill characters at some times. There are times the characters have, have to get killed because there's no other recourse. Especially in a horror game. Everything's... Exactly, Lauren. Everything's very... Everything is very character-focused. I'm more attached to your guys' characters in my D&D game than I am to any of my own characters. Because I've seen how important those characters are to everybody. How important everybody else's characters are. I don't, I don't care about my characters dying. And I, I say this all the time. And in fact, I almost, I almost got killed in our session zero of D&D &D last night with Blake running it. And he's like, I thought I was going to have to kill your character. I'm like, I'm going to make another character. I mean, I like my character. He's fun, you know, but I, I've made so many characters. I think that's part of it too. Now, PJ and I are pretty jaded. We've, we've probably made, you know, hundreds of characters over the years. So it's, you know, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, here's another character. I do have characters that I played for very specific games at very specific times in my life. That I have an attachment to the situations around playing the character. I can't say, and I'm more attached to the group and the people I was playing with them at the time. 
Yeah, I mean, I have, and I have so many character concepts, you know. I, I just will... And, and they shift. Like, for Lauren's game, it shifted radically. It was originally going to be something something totally different. Something that dealt with necromancy and spiritualism and all this. And then it just, you know, kind of retained some seed of that. And then it just went entirely over to, um, you know, someone who's, who's clinically insane. So... We can fill in the blanks from there. So yeah, and that's another thing. You know, if you really love a character and they die in a particular campaign, it doesn't mean you can't never play them again. It depends how purist you are, though. Because I do know some purists, even some really old school purists. Well, yeah, exactly, and that's kind of and that's kind of where I'm at too. Like, I, I definitely try to make the most. And here's the other thing, and we could do a whole second. You know, Blake actually suggested character death for tonight's topic. Um, in a kind of roundabout, humorous way. But I already talked about that a little bit once. But I I think it depends to how you position your player characters. Personally, too. So, you know, and I've, I've talked to this, this person who she has not made it on to any of the games, or any of the chats, rather. A student of mine who, who left this year. Uh, she literally has tattoos of her characters, right? Talk about an emotional investment in your characters. To me, that's a very, a very personal treatment of a character as an extension of self. I, I'm perfectly okay with my characters dying too. So what does this attachment have to do with this concept of backstory? How much is too much of that? How much is not enough of that? You know, like at what point, at what point are you so invested in the character that losing the character could be dangerous to your health? You know, and I have seen people who have gotten so attached to their characters that if something really horrible happens to the character, they get extremely upset. I mean, modern day, this was you know, 20 years ago, modern day maybe we would say it was a little bit of a disassociative situation where they were so invested in their character they had trouble divorcing their feelings from it. But is that bad? You know, really, like again, the way we, the way we look at things like escapism and fantasy has so radically changed in the last 30 years. Is being that attached to your character that you've created that's an extension of you bad i mean in the, in the situation that i witnessed it it was very unhealthy because this person got upset to the point of being acting in a dangerous fashion because their character had been killed and it wasn't just a temper tantrum it was a real emotional response um and it was it was definitely a little bit like okay maybe we do need to take a step back and maybe this person should be playing chess and not an rpg you know so I think that was a case where, by the way, they had a very extensive backstory for their character. Not shocking. Um, and their character was definitely an extension of, of a disassociative fantasy, in, in my opinion. Not, not being a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but looking back at it, I was like, yeah. So who here has woven a backstory into a game? That they've run. Or that they've played. Yeah, and again, I don't have... I've had people who have said, I played this character years ago. They're technically dead. Do you mind if I play it? I'm like, what do I care? You know, Are you, are you going to enjoy playing the character? You know, <laughs> Are you going to have fun in my game? Like, that's my main thing. Um, so both. So Wolfie, what, what has been your experience in terms of weaving these things in? Yeah, or, or ways that you've dropped or ways that you've dropped backstories to make them meaningful. So if, so you you develop it right around your characters. And that's that's a different that's a very different that's not not a different approach. It's a it's a different approach from if you were to just sit back and say, um, well, this is the dungeon, you know, and the character's like, but I'm looking for the halfling lover who stole 
my gem 30 years ago. Well, you're not going to find him in this dungeon, right? Like, give me back story of my mind for beats. So you were saying that earlier, PJ. That you mined it basically for story beats. You brought up things in terms of story beats. So, in terms of improv, yeah, so I'm, I'm reading I'm what I'm saying, but I tend to like to put hints of a person's backstory in, imply that there's someone or something from the past that could be influencing a plot or appearing in the story. Ah, that's funny. Spirit of the eye. Was that was that something he did he have any? Oh yeah, that's definitely that's definitely coming back. <laughs> that one's definitely coming back. Was he aware of the whole story of Grummish or any of that? Or no? Or was that or did he just make that up and it was just ironic because it because it actually fits orcish folklore, <laughs> you know? Like Yeah. Yeah. That's that's really that's really funny. It's like, oh, you read that as a game match, you're going, oh yeah, sure, that's definitely gonna come into play later. Yeah. Um, I you know, uh, full confession, I've had this bite me in the ass too, that one point I used I had a player that they get very emotionally attached to the characters, or or should I say not necessarily, but they get very invested in the plot. And the story and their characters will in the plot. And I pulled a hook from their backstory. And this was for, I, I don't know if it was a vampire game or a changeling game or something. It was a long time ago. And they actually acted on it so strongly based on the backstory that they ended up like totally screwing the rest of the party and the rest of the players. And I, I did not expect it, but I guess I should have. And they were so into role playing the character to the to the details of this backstory, they just had no problem just throwing them throwing the rest of the party to the wolves for it. I was like, wow. And then afterwards, when I talked to the players about it, they were like, well, he told you that's really what his character believes. And I'm like, well, I didn't think he'd really act on it in a game, you know. <laughs> like, so there was a case where my kind of detachment from characters, kind of detachment from. Envi game environments and, and to me it's this kind of literary exercise it didn't dawn on me that this player wouldn't follow the plot that they would turn around and just throw it all out the window including the other players that's pretty funny that's, that's pretty funny so he wrote that backstory though, that he had entered the same order Right, and at what point, so that goes back to the Fox Mulder example, like Fox Mulder would have thrown everybody to the wolves to find his sister. I mean, it wasn't quite like that, but it was a similar emotional gravity to this, this person playing this character in the context of the character. The full lowdown on the mom's opinion, that's hilarious. I don't think I've had any player character's mom appear in a game in quite a long time. Or, or wife or cousin or anything like that. Now, Andy, Andy, for the one vampire game, Andy had his, his human wife in the game. And he's a vampire. We were like, boy, this is so not going to end well. This is so not going to end well. And it never came to full, to full fruition. But... Yeah, I'm wondering what you said about like the backstory not really coming to full arc on the podcast it's that's the other that's the other challenge like if this is something the players really wanting to see worked through fulfilled it's really difficult sometimes to bring that and i think i actually said that in one of the the groups that i posted this in and was talking part of my concern about 
having really elaborate backstories is the player's expectation of it getting fulfilled. And it's always difficult. Because I know if it's important to them, they're going to want to see it come through. Yeah, and, and you know, the flavor of the... this. So this is something I've... I've been toiling with because I, you know, I have a lot of different types of friends who game and I have some friends who are totally like, oh, the rules don't matter. Screw those rules. You know, I just, it's, if it's funny, if it's cool, we do it. That's great. Um, like my kind of my core long time, like my old school friend players, we are totally like, all right, cool is cool. But like, if it is a rule, it's a rule for a reason. You know, like there's a, there's a reason mechanically why it's there, especially in like Pathfinder or D&D that are so rules heavy. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're all pretty much in agreement that you can get away and do cool, weird stuff and it's no problem. But but like if if it's distinctly out of the definition of how the game works, we try to avoid it. But yeah, like, you know, I, I have had players... In, in other games or players tell me about games where they do this really wacky stuff and everybody loves it. And I think it really depends on the climate of the game. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this open. We'll chat for a little bit. But I think this is a very good conversation. Thanks for everyone for dropping in, as always. And those of you lurking who haven't, who haven't talked, thanks for coming. I think the counterpoint of this is also true. So... How many of us as game masters have probably hundreds of pages written about NPCs, about locations, about backstory plots, <coughs> about historical events within the game world that nobody will ever see? How many, how many people has game masters do exactly what we're kind of busting on players for right now and have these extensive things written that, and I, I think for, and it's in it, it, the players. Yeah. Hey, no, nah, never. I would never do that. Yeah, exactly. Right. All of us. Yeah. So, and that's an interesting point, both both Wolfie and Merzane, like, is it a waste of effort? And that kind of goes back to the first question I asked, like, is, is, is this, even as a game master, but mostly as a player, because we're talking about character backstories. I actually, I never said player character backstories. It could be NPC. Is it a case where it is self-indulgence? And I think it's okay if it is. So I think this is an interesting point. Or Zane. And this is how I view it too. Uh, especially for historically based games, games set in a real world. Call of Cthulhu, Vampire, Ars Magica, any number of games that can be brought to an historical for me the historical research and writing into the historical research is is part of the fun for me. Like as a game master. Like even in the last game, the Old West game, the Old West Cthulhu game, I mean there were each each NPC that the players met had an entire history and set of motivations. That for the most part the players never saw it. And at one point, I kind of sat them down and I was like, just so you guys know, these aren't just the dudes with question marks and exclamation marks above their heads. Like, if you talk to them, you'll find out more. You know, like there's there's a lot in there that you need to find out through interacting. And I think they were like, Oh yeah, that's right. Like in D D, like the shopkeeper's the shopkeeper. Right? The guy that runs the tavern is the guy that runs the tavern. I think in different games. So back, don't see backstory. The love character last campaign. I pulled the veil back the new campaign, showed them the kind of merciless capitalists they are, and made that I upset them. That's really funny. That's really funny, PJ. So my thought is kind of what Merzane's going like. I've definitely recycled things as a game master that didn't get used in one game, or that weren't explored in one game, and dropped them into another game, even if I rebranded it. Maybe not to the extent that PJ did. Well, so so it kind of harkens back to Benny, right? The very early days of this, the first few game sessions where I was talking about uh, Benny and Call of Cthulhu, that Benny is this became this pivotal NPC in that scenario. 
And he literally, Justin literally made him up on the spot. When he was playing the town undertaker. And he said, well, I'd have a guy that would help me, right? I'd be like, yeah, probably. I'm like, what's his name? He's like, Benny. And like within a game session, we made up this whole character around Benny. That he was this salt of the earth working man, you know, like to go hunting and fishing. This nice guy everybody loves. Of course, he's the guy that got corrupted by the, you know, by the... By the mask of Neural Hotep. I'll, I'll say that right now because uh, uh, the game's been out. We've been out of the game for a while. He was absolutely corrupted by the crawling chaos and he became something else. But, you know, to start it was just hilarious because everybody got really attached to Benny and he was just kind of this dude. So, yeah, so as a musician, I also concur. And as a, and as a writer outside of gaming, Though now most of my writing is gaming. I totally concur. I save a copy of everything now, right? If a music, if I play something I like, even if I know I'm not going to use it anytime soon, I put it away for later. And it's funny because just recently with my main band, last rehearsal, I just pulled out something that I've been working on and they were like, all right, once we get through this rehearsal and these gigs, we or this gig and these rehearsals, I've, you know, we got to work on that. And I was like, good thing I actually remembered what I did, you know? <laughs> good thing I made some kind of note of that. Right. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Set piece encounters that the players just totally avoided. And I, I'm familiar with that too. Yeah. 30 unfinished songs. We don't have that many. I wish we had 30 unfinished. I, I wish we had 30 finished actually. Um, we have about eight finished, but I wish we had 30 un I wish we had 30 unfinished or 30 finished to, to draw. We have a lot of ideas. The band, unfortunately, just due to due time, distance, and scheduling, is not as tight as I'd like it to be. To anybody like it to be, not just me. Like we all know, it's a it's a thing, and we're trying to correct it. We're, we have a, several big rehearsals coming up, and we're trying to get it. We're trying to get it together. We have a we have a gig in September, supposedly, um, which I could talk more about once we have a couple of rehearsals, and I know we're I know we're on. I mean, we're all in. We're all one. We're all one hundred percent in right now. It's just physical distance time things like that but it's the same thing with gaming so i made the joke i made the joke the other day that gaming groups bands anything like this are are they only function if everybody's all in right <laughs> on the same page of, of ideas <clears throat> and i said this a couple weeks ago i think in fact one of my band members was on i said that I said that, you know, it's it's like everything else. If, if everybody's not on the same page, like, it's not going to work. And gaming groups are exactly like that, too. <clears throat> so that was interesting. Wolfie said that he doesn't have a whole bunch in terms of, like, deeply written <clears throat> GM content. Like I'm wondering how you how you approach it. I know you said you haven't run in a long time, but like, how would you approach it? Would you have it to be a more um, let's go a, a loose set of notes that you would then play off of as the characters, or Merzane, where you said a lot of it's improv? Do you have like a loose set of notes, cliff notes? Yeah. I think what I usually do is I have cliff notes for most things. I have my NPCs and my locations fairly well detailed. And then I have, I think I talked about it last time or two game sessions ago, if then, if then charts, you know, if then statements. If players go here and talk to this guy before this guy, this happens, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, for the big encounters or for the climactic scenes, I write it out. Yeah, yeah, same thing, same thing. Like I said, though, I, I'll sometimes find myself that I'll find something really interesting, especially historically. I'll write it in and I'll keep writing and I'll keep writing. And then I realize there's like four pages of history on this NPC that probably nobody will ever, you know, see except for me. And and that maybe they shouldn't see. And that's always the thing, too. Like, at what point, you know, is this really just about me and my playing this NPC and motivating the plot? And at least giving a valid reason as to why they would be motivating that plot.
Well, yeah. And for me, that's fun. And again, I know that's... Right. And again, I know that that's a definitely a case where a lot of people don't get the enjoyment out of that. They get the enjoyment of just sitting down and banging through the story and role playing and having their friends interact and you know that's their that's their motivation in all this. And I think that's I think that's very valid too. In fact, some of the most fun games I've played were things where the the game master really just kind of jumped off and went through um, a more improvised version of what they originally had. He's an arrow, man. So it's like an, like an Oten or all Yeah, yeah, in prison with the pharaohs, right? It's basically that story. <laughs> That's basically it. Has anyone seen the encounter? Do you have a whole backstory for your for your Andro Sphinx? Does he have a name? I also find naming monsters interesting. Like most of my monsters that have, of any note have a name attached. And I do that intentionally, you know, because they do have something else. And see, that's that's kind of a cool way to approach it as well, that you don't necessarily have to write this extensive backstory that there could just be something that you've devised. There's a dog lurking in the background. Something that you've devised. Yeah, the victim number. That you've devised that will motivate the plot. But it doesn't necessarily have to have these deep details. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an interesting approach. So the way I was, when I was talking to Tom about this yesterday, what, what he said, one of his tactics, especially for a group that's not necessarily good at improving, is he got them into the spirit of it a little bit by like when they're starting a game in a group situation like a tavern. Have them each pick one person in the tavern and describe it. Who do you see when you're sitting across from the tavern? And then when they talk about this, um, he, take, he makes notes of it. And he writes an NPC up around that description and has them come up. Maybe weeks later, months later. So that way there's been some investment on the part of the player into helping develop the world. And I think this goes into what we were talking about a few weeks ago in terms of world development, how much control do you give to the players, right? I think backstory is a way that maybe the players are trying to get a little bit of control, trying to get a little bit of um, agency over the game world. And I think it's wrong to shut it out. I think it's just you have to, man you have to balance it with how much of it will positively affect the game. You should learn name. Castanius. <laughs> cool. I'm going to entire. That's funny. That's pretty hilarious. Well, that's where I think having that kind of background of a character's motivations and ideas and whatnot comes into play, right? That's where I think it's valuable. That you can actually use it in the middle of the scenario and it becomes integral and it becomes fun and it becomes exciting. All right, guys, I think I'm gonna start wrapping it up for tonight. Or should I say people, not guys. Let's start sitting here, guys. They're noisy cats. Well, yeah, yeah, and that's and we've done that too as well. That instead of writing the sense of backstory, we've sat down, and we've even used some prompt cards from other games, like have people draw a prompt card that says, "You know, this player is sitting two people from the left from you, or whatever," and you have this relationship. Or this lack of relationship with them. And you tell me why. And sometimes I think that's more valuable than handing somebody 20 pages of history. Because uh, it gives you a real present motivation.
Can't just beef with hers. That's funny. Oh, she should be used to it. She's known you long enough. She should just, she should just be expecting that now. Well, yeah, and, it, and some games have come with that, and some supplements have come with that. Now, for a long time, you know, back when D&D was basically just, you were a hand with a sword. You weren't actually even a character, you know. Um, the supplements were coming out, even back in the 80s and early 90s, that gave you kind of personality definitions and relationship definitions that you could introduce into your games. So, again, this isn't new, you know, this isn't necessarily new. I think it's just become much more common for the new generation of players, which is great, to have a much more character-centric investment in the game and the game world. And these are all really good ideas. And it's cool to see the way people handle it and approach it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We said that earlier, and I, I think yeah, you were here from the start, where Lara said that, that that's, and I, I mentioned that all the younger players I know, for the most part, have a very heavy investment in characters and backstory. Well, exactly. And I think that goes back to that. And that's kind of funny because quoting that directly, um, I one of the LARPers I know posted saying uh, essentially how awful she thought Warhammer was because all the characters were so two-dimensional. And I'm like, but that's kind of the point. This isn't a LARP. You know what I mean? This isn't something where it, the characters are meant to be these deeply invested, deeply, you know... In, in, in you know intense characters with these with these strong motivations and conflicts they're meant they're meant to be caricatures in a way thank you a beer has appeared next to me it's a satire warhammer warhammer is a satire written during the british cold war of fantasy you know, that is really a satire of Tolkien in, in a lot of ways. And it's tra and transposed Cold War Europe, post-World War II Europe into, you know, <coughs> into a fantasy setting. So that's funny is uh, another friend of mine said that. He was really, he said, I do, the, I do a lot better when I don't think of this as amateur theater. When I think of it as just a game. Yeah, it's Judge Dredd Marshall for Fantasy Fantasy, basically. But right, no, I and I and I definitely feel that like especially the LARP and the theater crowd, there is there is an a different expectation and a different onus from a gaming environment. Now, we have a lot of role playing in our Warhammer fantasy game. So we have a lot of a lot of role playing. In fact, it's far more role playing than it is combat. It's very two dimensional. Yeah, dog appearance. He's being very nudgy tonight. He's been circling. I put him out. He's come back in. Um, and I do find that it really depends on the environment. Now you're getting cat bombed again. See, very active, interactive animals. Um, I do find that it's the the game master who sets up. The dynamic and the expectation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's an interesting way to approach it. And you know, and as this is the hobbies developed, we've seen a lot of analysis and a lot of writing being done on why people play these games, right? And, and what are what are the functions of these games in society? And you know, there's so there's the old the old joke, and I, I used this joke during a, a global game jam a few years ago. You know, the the joke is the guy that'll that'll trap you and talk about his half work bard for four hours, right? Talk about people obsessed with their characters and backstories and all that. 
And I actually had that encounter at a, at a global game jam where there was this guy who just kept telling me about his D and D character. I was like, I was like, okay, you have to stop. Yeah, you have to stop. I was like, don't tell me anymore about your character. You know, I was like, tell me anymore about your character. I'm walking away. And so he started. I just, I just walked away from him. And he got really offended. I was like, look, I told you stop. You know, so again, there's that thing of like, okay, like how much you being into your character, how much does that impact the game and how much does that actually start to impede the game? <laughs> yeah. React to turn the cohort. Yeah, and, and again, that's, and that goes back to what we started with, that, yeah, and I was the only player like, what is wrong with you? Jimmy's dead. Yeah, exactly. Well, but that also talks about the level of investment we're willing to put into RPGs. You know, I, I don't know. I don't think you were there, PJ. I don't think you were there for the LARP years ago when... Um, the two vampire hunters in the one game got taken out. And the guy playing the one vampire hunter was such a good actor. People were actually afraid that he had gotten hurt. And, and, they, and you know, it was this really interesting thing that he got so invested in his character. And when his character finally gets killed, he goes this really dramatic death scene to the point that people actually were uncomfortable with it. And I was like, that was really brilliant. Talk about improv. I mean, that was completely off the cuff. All right, friends, I think we're going to start winding it down. It's a very good conversation. I'll leave the chat room open for a little bit. If people want to continue chatting, but all in all, I think we had, I think it was a good, a good take, a lot of interesting takes. I think, you know, we get to the point of what all of us um, can say and can analyze that it, almost all of our chats end up like this. It really depends on the nature of your game. It really depends on the nature of the group. And it depends on how this idea, this concept of story is presented. Is it all about the player who wrote it or can it be integrated into the campaign at large? And is the game master able and willing to do that? I will, in closing, pop this back up just for people who happen to be coming on who are not regulars. Okay, I'm going to buzz off. I'm going to leave the chat room going for a bit. The stream will still be running. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming in. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. And by the way, if anybody has ideas for these chats, I mean, I have quite a few already kind of penned and set up yeah have a good night thanks for stopping in it was great to meet you even though i think we did meet in person at some point it's good to good to meet you again um if anyone has any ideas that they'd like to see addressed feel free to shoot me a line feel free to uh you know send me a private message in one form or another and i'll i'll see you all sooner or later thanks a lot